The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. This is a WCET in SAN webcast. Working with your financial aid office to maintain compliance. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET and work very closely with Cheryl. As we go through the webinar today, if you have any questions, please enter them into the question box and we'll be sure to get to them as we can. We'll hold questions till the end of the presentation portion and then we will be sure to answer those. If by chance we don't get to all of the questions that are asked during the webinar, we'll pull those out, share them with the presenters and get written responses back to you. If you'd like to follow along, you can click on the handout pane, and there you can download the slides as well as additional resources. The webinar is being recorded, and we will send a link out shortly after the presentation. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box. And today's moderator is Cheryl Dowd, who I'm sure you all know, so please take it away, Cheryl. Thank you very much, Megan. I appreciate Megan helping us with the webinar today. Uh, I'm Cheryl Dowd. I'm the director for the State Authorization Network with WCET. Very pleased that you all could be part of our uh, webinar today. This is the last in our series that was about collaboration. We have been trying to share um, with our members the importance of collaborating with a variety of offices at our institutions. And we're um, closing our collaboration uh, summer series uh, with talking about working with, with our financial aid offices. And we're very pleased to be able to have um, two colleagues from NASFA um, who will be presenting with us today. We'll have Jill Dejan, who is a policy analyst with NASFA. NASFA stands for the National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators. In her role, Jill works with NASFA members to develop policy recommendations, provide feedback, on legislative proposals and summarizes financial aid related policy issues for NASFA's members and other audiences. Prior to joining NASFA, Jill enjoyed a 20 year career in financial aid administration, having held roles in the financial aid offices at Tufts University of um, Medicine, MIT, Brandeis University, and the College of Holy Cross in Massachusetts, as well as the New School in New York City. Jill joined NASPA in 2016 and now lives in Maryland with her husband Greg and three children, Matthew, William, and Charlotte. And she also served um, as a moderator for uh, Russ and myself when we presented at the NASPA conference uh, in June in Austin. We really appreciated that and really have gotten a lot out of the NASPA conferences both this year and last year, um, you know, presenting at their conference. And our other presenter today is is Mandy Sponholtz. She is the Standards of Excellence Administrator for NASPA. In this role, she supports over 30 peer reviewers across the country who perform SOE reviews um, throughout the year. She manages the daily operations of the program, Standards of Excellence program, and looks for ways to improve and expand their, this service. Mandy began her career, as many financial administrators do, as a student employee at Fort Hayes State University, where she earned her bachelor's degree. She then worked as a financial aid counselor and assistant director at the University of Kansas while earning her master's degree in higher education administration. While at KU, she also served as the secretary and treasurer of CASFA, the Kansas Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators. From there, Mandy joined USA Funds to conduct training sessions and provide policy guidance to students nationwide, assisting them on how to interpret the thousands of Title IV rules and regulations. She joined NASFA in 2015 as a policy analyst is excited to be serving NASFA members in this SOE administrator role. Mandy telecommutes from her home in Lawrence, Kansas, where she lives with her husband, Scott, also a financial aid administrator, and their two girls, Morgan and Ashley. When she's not discussing R2T4 at the dinner table, Mandy enjoys triathlons, reading and cooking, but not cleaning up the mess. I understand that one. Uh, we're really pleased to have Jill and Mandy with us today, and um, I'm going to turn it over to them um, to share with us about working with with the financial aid offices and also about their um, peer review program. I think we'll all find um, a lot of good information from this. So I'm going to turn it over to them. Thanks, Cheryl. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. This is Jill. I'll be starting things off for us today. I'm really happy to be here and thank you, Cheryl, for that warm welcome. Um, I hope you'll all get a lot out of this webinar. 
Compliance makes up a significant chunk of the financial aid office's responsibilities. So I think you'll see today, if you don't already know it, that your offices have a lot more in common than others on campus might assume and even that you might assume. So as we discuss ways compliance officers can work with their financial aid offices today, we plan to cover an overview of NASPA's programs and services, both for our members and our non-members, a description of the functions performed by the financial aid office, what they do day to day. We'll go over the differences between an audit, a program review, and a peer review. And finally, we'll discuss the consequences of non-compliance with the federal regulations governing eligibility for the Title IV financial aid program. Next slide, please. Before we get started, I just wanted to give you a little bit of information about who NASPA is and what we do here. NASPA is the largest post-secondary education association with institutional membership in Washington, D.C., and is the only national association with a primary focus on student aid legislation, regulatory analysis, and training for financial aid administrators in all sectors of post-secondary education. NASPA provides professional development and services for financial aid administrators, advocates for public policies that increase student access and success, and serves as a forum on student financial aid issues. NASPA's membership is comprised of over 22,000 student financial aid professionals across the country at nearly 3,000 post-secondary institutions who serve nine out of every 10 undergraduates in the U.S. This is Marianne. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, at least on my screen, I'm not seeing the correct slide. Cheryl, do you see the correct slide yeah, on yours? Let me fix that quickly. And Megan, I think it just went backwards. Our apologies. We're straightening that up <laughs> straight away. Thank you very, very much, Marianne. Of course. Thank you, guys. Okay, so I'm finished with that one. We can move on to the next slide. Uh, you went backwards again. There we go. Thank you. So NASPA's memberships are offered at the institutional versus the individual level, which means that anyone at an institution that holds an institutional membership can take advantage of our services. And those services include today's news, which is our daily newsletter. It includes both original content written by NASPA staff on timely financial aid issues, as well as links to relevant outside content. We also offer a student aid index, which is a central hub of financial aid regulations, legislation, and other key resources. We have an amazing product called Ask Regs, which is a searchable knowledge base of answers to financial aid administrators' common questions, plus a service that allows users to submit new questions that are answered within 48 hours by our training and regulatory assistance staff. And those questions are, and answers are then added to the knowledge base for everyone to access. We have a compliance engine and policies and procedures builder, which are tools to help financial aid offices monitor and document their compliance with federal regulations. And our membership also includes policy update and NASPA tools webinars. And finally, compiled Higher Education Act legislation and Department of Education regulations, if you really want to dig in. Next slide, please. So depending on the membership option your institution chose, you might also have access to NASPA's full suite of training webinars, our online course offerings at NASPA U, which is our nationally recognized rigorous program of education in administering the Title IV student financial aid programs, and credentialing. Finally, NASPA offers services beyond our membership benefits at an additional cost, which includes things like our Certified Financial Aid Administrator Program, which is something that's brand new. We're actually in the process of developing it now, and it is set to launch next summer in 2019. And um, with the CFAA, financial aid administrators will be able to earn a certification through a combination of their own experience in education, by committing to certain standards of ethics, and by passing an exam to demonstrate that they have the skills necessary to perform the role of a financial aid administrator. We also offer an annual conference every summer and a leadership conference every spring, and of course our Standards of Excellence peer review program, which we'll describe later in the webinar in more detail. Next slide, please. Even if your institution is not a member of NASPA, you can still access our free services, which include today's news, which I mentioned earlier, Anyone can sign up to receive that daily newsletter right to your inbox, even if you're not a member. Um, our conferences do charge a registration fee, but are open to all. NASPA offers selected free webinars in addition to our paid offerings on topics like policy updates and NASPA's tools. And our weekly podcast, which is called Off the Cuff, with new episodes released every Friday. 
We are taking a break from um, the podcast for the month of August, but visit our website or your favorite podcast app to listen to new episodes starting after Labor Day. Um, or you can always listen in on one of our archived episodes anytime. The podcast is a great way to get a quick, high-level, relaxed overview of what is happening in the financial aid world and in higher ed in general. The format is light and casual. It's pretty entertaining. Next slide, please. So what do financial aid administrators do? If you asked one, they'd probably tell you that the bulk of their work involves managing the application and awarding process for financial aid. But financial aid administrators wear many hats, and they also do things like facilitate, facilitate the receipt of significant sums of money from the all federal, state, and private sources to not only help students meet the cost of tuition and fees, but also their education-related expenses, things like books, housing, and transportation that they still need to pay for in order to be successful in college. Financial aid administrators ensure compliance with federal and state laws and regulations, as well as, well as with institutional policies. And they provide extensive counseling services. They not only explain how to apply for aid and the terms and conditions of the aid students are eligible for, but they also provide students with debt management, financial literacy education, anything from creating and sticking to a budget, making smart borrowing decisions, loan repayment strategies, and pretty much everything in between. As they advocate for efficient, effective financial aid programs for sensible regulations to ensure that colleges and universities can focus their energies on their missions and on their students. Next slide, please. So in order to avoid financial penalties and also to retain institutional eligibility for the Title IV federal student aid programs, programs which include things like the federal Pell Grant, the federal direct loan program, and federal work study, institutions must demonstrate administrative capability, including having sufficient staff to process the number of aid applications they manage, as well as to counsel all of those students and parents about the financial aid process. They have to demonstrate that they have a system of checks and balances in place that includes a separation of duties between authorizing financial aid payment from the duties of dispersing those aid funds. And they must have adequate technological resources to participate in data exchanges with the Department of Education. Institutions also must demonstrate financial responsibility, which includes having adequate cash reserves and being current on debt payments and all other financial obligations. And they must provide students with almost 70 pieces of consumer information and disclosures, ranging from publishing, publishing campus crime and safety data, you may have heard of the Cleary Act, um, that's what that involves, to informing students of their rights and responsibilities as a federal student loan borrower, both before they borrow loans and um, at the end of their studies before they graduate, and even providing an educational program each year to commemorate Constitution Day. Um, those are just some, a few examples of those many pieces of consumer information that um, our Title IV financial aid is contingent upon. Consumer information must not misrepresent the nature of the institution's educational program, financial charges, or the employability of the institution's graduates. The Higher Education Act defines misrepresentation as erroneous or misleading statements made by the institution or its representatives that might affect a student's decision to attend. And it's important to note that misrepresentation can occur either by commission, by making a blatantly false statement, or omission, the failure to disclose certain information, and covers not only those required disclosures of consumer information that I mentioned, but also any claims made in form such as advertising or even verbal statements made by the institution or its representatives. So with all that, I'm going to pass things off to Mandy. Next slide, please. Great, right, thanks. Um, th this is Mandy, and thank you for having us here today. We're very excited to be presenting about um, financial aid administrators and how we can all work together. Um, to just build a little bit on Jill's comments, hopefully you can see now that the work of financial aid administrators really touches just about everything on campus. Um, so as, as many of you are compliance officers, your work obviously touches everything on campus, but there are so many different intersections where financial aid has a, has a very similar role. Um, there's some obvious overlaps, like information that we get from the admissions office or the registrar's office regarding student enrollment, um, and as, as well with the business and bursar's office because they deal with finances and payments and so forth. But some of those rules um, that govern financial aid that Jill just mentioned also intersect with things like academic advising, um, information technology, as well as campus security. 
Um, a few years ago, um, uh, click to the next one, please. A few years ago, um, NASA wanted to gain a greater understanding of college presidents' perceptions of their financial aid offices, financial aid administrators, and just kind of the profession in general. Um, our research found that the top one word response that presidents used to describe financial aid administrators was the word essential. And if the president thinks that the financial aid office is essential, then it's likely that others do as well. Um, next slide, please. So due to that essential nature of financial aid offices and the funding that they manage, they are subject to a plethora of rules and regulations. To verify that schools are following the rules, um, those schools are subject to annual audits and federal program reviews. Um, those can result in monetary fines that Jill mentioned earlier. Um, but schools also have the opportunity to utilize NASA's peer review service, the Standards of Excellence Review Program, um, to help avoid those issues um, resulting from audits or program reviews. So basically, try to catch it before something happens. Next slide, please. First, let's take a look at audits. Um, institutions of higher education have to have financial and compliance audits performed annually. Um, a couple of slides ago, Jill was talking about administrative capability and financial capability. And basically, those are what audits are looking at. So the financial audits are looking at that financial capability piece. And as a result, those audits have to be performed by licensed accountants. Generally speaking, um, schools, in order to save money and probably in some cases some headache for trying to find another auditing firm, schools generally hire the same firm to perform compliance audits as well. This means that someone who is usually not familiar with financial aid is likely auditing those financial aid compliance issues. Even if you do have someone who's familiar with the rules, your auditors don't always catch the compliance issues due to the small amount of guidance that the Department of Education provides to auditors. Now, we know that that guidance is being revised and, and beefed up a little bit, but really in comparison to some of the other uh, review services that are out there, um, audits are still very, very small as far as what they will actually look at based on what the Department of Education has said that they need to look at. Um, the results of the audits are sent to the Department of Education and reviewed by the Department of Education every year. And if the department sees anything that's a little out of place, that can trigger a program review. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so what's a program review? Now, just like audits, federal program reviews are required by law. But unlike audits, program reviews can happen at any time. There's no set schedule for a school to have a program review as long as it happens on a systematic basis. So while audits are required annually, you're not necessarily going to have a program review every five or 10 or 20 years. The department can come whenever they see fit. Program reviews evaluate the school, not just the financial aid office. This is why understanding that complying with financial aid rules and regulations is an institution-wide effort, and why it's so awesome that you as compliance officers want to hear more about what we do in financial aid because there is so much overlap. Um, program reviews will look at the school's compliance with federal Title IV provisions, which, like we've talked about, encompass more than just making sure the right students get the right money at the right time. As we mentioned earlier, some of these rules touch areas like campus safety, academic advising, um, misrepresentation, which can go even to your university relations or publications department. So having everyone understand their role in complying with the rules and regulations really can't be underscored enough. Um, next slide, please. We will often get the question, it's like, why does the Department of Education conduct these program reviews? Why don't, why, why don't they just trust us? 
Um, and really, I mean, the schools, the schools have a significant amount of money from the Department of Education. And so the schools have to demonstrate that they're effectively managing those federal funds that are entrusted to them. Um, in fact, like I mentioned, program reviews are required by law. So the Higher Education Act um, states, and I'm, I'm going to read this straight from the language, that program reviews exist, quote, in order to strengthen the administrative capability and financial responsibility provisions, end quote, of schools that participate in Title IV aid programs. So really, you know, that, that financial capability is, is important, but it's that administrative capability piece, which really encompasses all areas of Title IV aid. So, I mean, the, the department wants to make sure that their money is being spent effectively. Next slide, please. So now that we've covered um, how the department monitors schools' compliance with rules and regulations, basically through annual audits and program reviews, um, NASFA wants to make sure that we help our members stay in compliance. And as Jill mentioned, we, we cover just about every school in the nation. We cover over 90% of the undergraduates um, in the United States. So chances are pretty good that you are a NASFA member. Um, so as Jill mentioned earlier, we have several training resources available through our, our webinars and the credentialing program and the certification program that's coming up. Um, even the podcast is a great way to just stay informed. Um, but we also have this peer review service called the Standards of Excellence or SOE program review. Um, the SOE review is objective, it's completely confidential, and it evaluates your institution's delivery of student financial aid. We also take a look at other compliance areas like consumer information, like Joe mentioned earlier, that administrative capability piece of things as well. Um, we also can customize the reviews a little bit. If there's something in particular that your school wants to focus on, um, we will certainly do our best to make sure that we address that in a little bit more depth. Um, we also point out all of the great things that your institution is doing well, all of your strengths, as well as any areas where you're out of compliance or even make improvements to serve your students. So it's not just focused on compliance, it is going to take a look at your institution on a holistic level. Um, next slide, please. So NASFA offers two peer review services. Um, the full SOE review and the consumer information assessment. For the full SOE review, we bring a team of currently practicing financial aid administrators to your campus to evaluate your Title IV operations. Um, we'll take a look at your compliance with rules and regulations. Um, we'll also take a look at a sample of your student files. We will survey your students. We'll survey your staff. We'll take a look at how you're using your technology, take a look at your physical facilities. It really is a, a very comprehensive review. Um, we've even had schools tell us that a full SOE review mirrors a federal program review, but it, it takes an even deeper dive because we're taking a look at technology, we're, we're talking with the staff, we're talking with the students about issues that are outside of compliance as well. But the thing that's very different between an SOE review and a federal program review is that an, we've been told that an SOE review is very friendly and very collegial. And that is because we, pro, we have these reviews done by currently practicing financial aid administrators. These are the folks that are in the trenches every day and understand the rules and the regulations. Next slide, please. Now, each full SOE review also contains a consumer information assessment, which is something we also offer as a standalone service. Um, consumer information is one area where monetary fines can add up very, very quickly. So we wanted to offer schools a cost-effective review of consumer information reporting and disclosure activities. Now, this review is conducted completely off-site, but the peer reviews conducting these reviews all have NASA's credential and consumer information. Um, with that, I'm going to pass things back over to Jill, who's going to share with you some of those financial consequences of not complying with rules and regs that we've alluded to, but now we're really going to get into the nitty-gritty details.
Jill, I think you might be on mute. Well, thank you twice, Ben. Thank you for notifying me that I was on mute, and <laughs> thank you for handing things out for me. Um, sorry about that delay. Um, so Mandy's covered what a program review does, but what financial consequences could result from a program review? So program reviews can result in two types of consequences. There are liabilities and there are fines. A liability is a fund or funds that schools must repay to the Department of Education because those funds were dispersed in error. An example of a situation where funds might be dispersed in error um, is the return to Title IV funds, also known as R2T4, um, that thing that Mandy mentioned she talks about at the dinner table. Um, <laughs> she's the first person I've ever met who's <laughs> noted such a thing. Um, but certainly, if you know anyone in the financial aid office, you've likely heard them complain about this. Um, it's kind of a bear. It's a process that financial aid offices must follow when a student withdraws to determine what portion of federal funds were earned by the student while they were enrolled and what portion need to be returned to the Department of Education. And it's pretty complicated calculation and there's a lot of opportunity for error. So as a result, errors do take place. And those errors can result in liabilities for the school if the wrong amount of funds were returned to the Department of Education. And just a fun fact, um, in fiscal year 2016, the Department of Education actually imposed over $16 million in liabilities through program reviews, not strictly for return to Title IV funds, but for um, liabilities for all types of um, improperly dispersed student, uh, federal student aid funds. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, that was an animation. There we go. Okay. The other type of financial consequences that can arise from a program review is a fine. And fines operate um, a little bit more like a speeding ticket. They're a punishment for not following the rules versus just a repayment of funds that you received um, improperly. One of the most common area fines occurs with that Clery Act that I mentioned earlier, which is also known as the Campus Safety um, Rule, um, for violations resulting from that, from improperly or not reported um, campus safety and crime statistics. The maximum fine for campus safety violations right now is just under $55,000, and that represents nearly a $20,000 increase from the prior maximum, which had been $35,000. The important thing to note there is that fine is for a single violation, so the cost can really add up quickly um, with these types of um, violations. Next slide, please. So how does the financial aid office reduce risk for compliance findings? Um, they certainly um, they see that as their job, and they're pretty good at it. Um, they stay on top of changing rules and regulations by taking advantage of the services offered by their professional associations, places like NASFA, as well as their regional and state associations. Um, they also take advantage of tools like NASFA's peer review program, um, standards of excellence, the compliance engine and policies and procedures builder to ensure that their compliance is also ongoing, not just that they're keeping apprised of what's new, but also that they are um, staying up to date on um, compliance and regulations that are already in place. And they rely on many other offices on campus, including yours, to understand both the importance of compliance and to manage the compliance tasks that might fall out of their purview, but they have consequences for institutional eligibility for Title IV financial aid. I wanted to share a quick data point from that staffing survey that Mandy mentioned earlier um, of our members back in 2015 um, about administrative burden. Um, on that survey, our members indicated that administrative burden of compliance specifically was the number one reason they feel that they're under-resourced in terms of staffing. And I think that really brings home the point that they have to rely on the entire institution to maintain campus. Uh, to maintain compliance, pardon me. Next slide, please. So finally, how can compliance staff and financial aid staff work together? A great way to start the conversation for you if you were trying to get into a more collaborative relationship with the financial aid office would be to explore NASA's resources on your own. I'd suggest you know visiting our web page, our daily newsletter is the is very prominent on the um, on our, our front page. You could um, read a couple of articles in today's news, listen to our podcast. As I mentioned, we don't have any new ones right now, but we've got some archived ones. And it really is 
pretty fun to listen to despite the topic um that our our colleagues who um, participate in the podcast have a very collegial relationship and they take things pretty lightly so it's actually quite fun um but from there whatever you pick up from reading or from listening um you could ask a colleague in the financial aid office maybe a specific clarifying question um about something you saw that you didn't understand you know something as simple as hey i saw this thing on naspa i had no idea you guys did that or can you tell me more about it um can you explain that to me and that's a great way to open that door of communication Financial aid administrators love what they do, and they love to talk about it too. They wear a lot of hats and they've got a lot to balance. Um, and I think a lot of times they find that the people who reach out to them um, come from a place of, why can't we do this? Why is it this way? You know, um, And financial aid administrators end up having to explain the rules and regulations. This kind of makes them look like the bad guy. <laughs> um, frequently, financial aid administrators will lament the fact that they're seen as the office of no. <laughs> Whenever someone wants to do something really cool, the financial aid office has some reason why that's against the rules. So I know they'd love to hear from someone like you guys who understands compliance issues, why they're so important to the institution's well-being, and I know that they'll see you as an ally on campus and really appreciate that relationship. And so that concludes the content portion of our webinar. We'd like to open things up to questions. Well, that was terrific, Jill and Mandy. Thank you very much for your um, for your explanations and your direction. Um, before we take some questions, I was wondering if you could share a little bit. We have uh, handouts in the handout section, everyone. Um, one of them is the slide deck uh, that you can uh, download for yourself, but also um, Mandy and Jill shared with us some um, other um, documents that you may want to review as well. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Sure. Mandy, would you like to? Or do you want me to? Um, go for it. Okay. Yeah, I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we actually developed this for use on our Hill visits um, when we're visiting with congressional uh, members of Congress and their staff um, to uh, to just explain a little bit more about um, what financial aid administrators do, since not everybody knows. Um, and so, as you can see, it's sort of broken up into four sections. Um, this is a, a good way to break up those those many responsibilities that fall um, under the purview of financial aid, what they do for students and families, which obviously involves, um, as I mentioned, kind of explaining about the types of financial aid they can get, helping them to navigate the application process, which is actually quite complex, um, helping students with just sort of general financial literacy, managing their debt, making smart borrowing decisions, creating a budget, um, students really come to the financial aid office with any and all financial related questions, many of which we usually can't answer, um, but they, they see the financial aid office as experts and as a great resource for all things money related, and that's great. Um, from the institution's point of view, obviously we mentioned the, um, the compliance issue. Um, financial aid offices are essential to enrollment management, um, helping to get students in the door and helping students to stay. Without the funds to be able to come to your college, you wouldn't have any students in your college. So <laughs> thank the financial aid office for that, um, as well as the efforts of your admissions office and many other people on campus. Um, and the financial aid office runs the federal work study program, which I mentioned briefly when I was talking about the types of financial aid that are available, um, which provides on-campus jobs to students, which actually support a ton of operations on campus. Um, as Mandy mentioned, she was a work study student in the financial aid office when she was an undergraduate. I was a work study student in the financial aid office when I was an undergraduate. Um, I also worked in the mail room and I worked in the dining hall. So there were students working all over campus who were supported by the federal work study program, which is administered by the um, financial aid office. Um, financial aid administrators are also out there in the community. Um, financial aid office, um, officers frequently go out to high schools. Uh, to talk to high school uh, juniors and seniors about the financial aid application process and really complement the work of guidance counselors there. Um, and um, they also, uh, as part of the federal work study program, there is a requirement that institutions spend 7% of their funds on um, community service projects. And so financial aid administrators are putting students out into the community to complete this community service work. Um, and financial aid administrators are actively involved in um, the in, um, policy making uh, in the, from the point of view of reaching out to their, uh, their local, state, local, and um, federally elected officials to talk about financial needs and challenges of their students, 
um, to give feedback on student aid legislation, both things that have been proposed and things that are out there already, that what's good about them, what's bad about them, how they can be better. And they provide a lot of data that, um, that uh, lawmakers use to come up with new policies. So that was just sort of a little thing we came up to try to talk a little bit about what our financial aid administrators do so that um, it doesn't, to give a clearer idea of a lot of the stuff that you may not think about. That's perfect because what we've been trying to say about our, um, for our compliance folks is to have an understanding of what some of the offices do and what interactions would be um, helpful um, for everybody to be able to uh, manage their, uh, their roles. So um, thank you for adding that. So you folks can include that um, in your downloads if you like. And uh, something that I didn't mention at the top of the webcast is that the recording of this webcast and the slide deck and these additional um, documents that they've created and shared will be available on the SAN website for SAN members to be able to have access to and share um, you know, after the webcast is completed. So um, I appreciate that you've shared those. And, uh, and yes, I, I uh, wanted to get this out before I get to our questions. And we do have a good question here. Um, most of, as you know, most of our institutions um, are doing a lot of online work. And so we have a question here about online universities. And what our um, member would like to ask is, could you please confirm that 100% online universities are not subject to the safety reporting from the Clery Act? Mandy, do you know that off the top of your head? I don't. There, there are certain pieces of the Clery Act that only apply to schools that have on-campus housing, but there are other parts of the Clery Act that may still apply to online institutions because they require you to report um, things that may involve stu uh, your school employees um, as well as the buildings um, on that campus. And so even though you don't have a physical campus with students, there may still be requirements because they because the safety reporting doesn't just apply to your students, it applies to your employees as well. Um, there is a consumer information and disclosure list as one of your handouts um, that the last update on that was 2017, but there have not been significant, if any, changes that I'm aware of to the consumer information reporting. So the Clery Act piece will be in there. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at the regulations outlined in the Clery Act piece of that. Um, if you do have further questions, and as long as you're an ASFA member, you are welcome to use our Ask Regs resource as well. Um, if you just go to the NASFA website, nasfa.org, Ask Regs is under one of the, uh, the tools that you can use, and you are welcome to, to take a look out there to see if other, other similar questions have been asked. But to the best of my knowledge, um, online schools do have certain pieces that need to be reported out um, to employees at least and possibly to students as well, even though they will not have a presence on your, in your buildings on your quote unquote campus. Thank you. That's, that was very helpful. Uh, what other questions do we have? Um, we have some time here to take a few more questions. And uh, please, if you could enter your questions into the question box that's on the dashboard that you'll find there, um, we'd be happy to uh, entertain a few more questions. Um, as, as Mandy and, and Jill and I have talked, um, one of the things that we've, we've tried to talk about is the interactions that are important, and I just mentioned that before. The NASFU, I, I actually took a NASFU course, and I found that very helpful too. Um, to be able to have a good understanding of, of how um, the interactions work from the financial aid office. I think that they you can find that there is a lot of similar work that is um, ongoing and um, collaboration uh, between the state authorization office, whatever that lands in, whether it's in the provost office or distance learning or whatever, um, you know, having that interaction with financial aid office is a really a prudent um, measure for our compliance staff members. Are there any other questions that, that we see? Cheryl? Yes. This is Marianne. I actually have a question, if, if I can. Good. Um, ladies first, thank you so much. This was really, really helpful. I, I don't know a lot about the financial aid office. Um, 
And so this was really helpful for me to kind of put it in context and kind of get a good sense of what's going on there. My question to you both is, how much do you think financial aid folks know about state authorization? Is that something that's talked about in those circles and that our compliance folks could kind of knock on these doors and already have an, an entry into a conversation? Or is it something more that maybe the folks need to maybe even start at the beginning? So I was just kind of hoping you might be able to share a little insight as far as financial aid folks um, knowledge base of state authorization. I can start on that. Um, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I would say state authorization probably falls lower on the priority list for financial aid administrators because most of the responsibility for actually putting it into place um, falls outside of their office. We do our best at NASFA to understand it because <laughs> it's really complicated. We actually rely really heavily on you guys. I'm sure Cheryl can attest to the fact that I've asked many questions of her and Russ um, for clarification when I'm writing articles. But um, we do, um, you know, whenever something new comes out about state authorization, we really followed um, all of the action that happened this spring on state authorization. And we do make sure that our members are notified via um, original content in today's news to try to translate it into terms that they can relate to. But I would say it doesn't impact their day-to-day -day compliance activities very much. And so I think, you know, if you went to a financial aid office and said, hey, can we talk about state authorization? They would be like, I know what that is. <laughs> and this is the, the bit that I know. Tell me more or whatever. I, I think certainly they're in a position to be able to collaborate. Um, but I would say that probably most financial aid administrators would not consider themselves to be the experts. Would you look at it that way, Mandy? I would agree with that. Some schools are, at least some financial aid offices are more in tune with state authorization um, because they do have higher um, higher online presence. And that seems to be where the, the rubber meets the road for financial aid. It's just making sure that students, especially in those online programs, are still able to get the funding that they need to go to school. That's really all it boils down to. So if you want to open up that conversation a little bit wider, I would, I would approach it from a, a perspective of making sure the program stays eligible so the students get the money. Um, but I also think it's going to vary from school to school. You're going to have financial aid administrators who um, maybe have a little bit more of that administrative burden challenge that Jill was talking about earlier um, with respect to, you know, um, with, with respect to this may not be their highest priority and others that are just a little bit more in tune with it. Every financial aid uh, director especially is going to be in tune with it a little bit differently. So I would say you can always start by approaching it middle of the road or go in and say, tell me what you know about state authorization and let's work together so that we're, we're on the, the same level playing field in order to move us forward. Um, I think the other frustration that we're experiencing right now is the, the plethora of changes that have come into state authorization. You guys recognize that a lot more than we do. Um, but if, if I could just be very candid, I think at some point, some financial like administrators are just like, I don't know what's going on with state authorization. I think I'm compliant. And they're just kind of throwing their hands up because as Jill mentioned, it's always not going to be front of mind um, because they have so many other things to deal with just to make sure that the students are getting the aid that they need. Um, I will say that you, know, you might be very excited after this webinar to go talk to your financial aid office. If you are a traditional school and you're getting ready to bring students into your campus or you've got students that have already been moving in, this is not the time to talk to them about state authorization. Wait at least three or four more weeks, um, you know, maybe get an appointment on their calendar sometime after Labor Day because August by and large is the busiest time of year um, in financial aid and it, it starts ramping up right after Memorial Day and it goes right through Labor Day and they are just head down processing, resolving conflicts, getting students their money. Um, that, that is their primary focus. So if you try to approach them right now about state authorization, you will not get the response that you would if you, if you just wait a couple of weeks. I'm just going to be very candid. <laughs> 
That is great advice, actually. That's that, I'm so glad you said that because you know sometimes we do get stuck in our little world of our calendar and when it's when it's convenient for us and and every now and then we forget to look around and realize that oh goodness gracious, financial aid is probably slammed, uh, like you said, through the middle of September uh, if they're on a traditional calendar. So thank you. That was very helpful. That's exactly what I was hoping hoping to hear. Thank you. Yes, that was. That was that was very helpful. I, I think another helpful piece that you brought up, and I'm, I'm sure Marianne will agree with me here, is you were talking about misrepresentation. And we talk to our folks about misrepresentation fairly regularly when it has to do with professional licensure. And um, you were talking about um, it's not only information that's shared, but it's um, informa uh, misrepresentation by omission. And that's a concern that we have as well. So we talk about that with our folks um, because that is a very present issue for our folks that have activities of a program that could occur outside of the state. So um, that's something in common that our compliance folks would have at the financial aid office is that they have face-to-face -face programs that have part of the program that occurs outside of the state and it leads to professional licensure. So um, those are some things that, you know, when it is appropriate to have some conversations that I think they could collaborate on um, to make sure that the compliance uh, issues are covered. So I was glad you brought that up. Um, any other questions uh, for anybody? I think this has been really helpful and I'm so grateful for the two of you to be here. Um, I, I want to underscore the today's news um, because I know I review that regular, I, I review that um, with Russ, Russ reviews it too. And uh, we also have um, some of our members that um, have reviewed that and, and have spoken very highly of it. So I, I encourage that. I encourage NASFA U for sure. I've had great experience with that. And the NASFA um, conference was, was really top notch the last two years. So appreciated being able to participate in that. Um, well, with there are no other questions, I do want to share um, that our contact, the contacts of our presenters right here. Um, so you, um, if you have any further questions, you know, you can contact me or contact our um, presenters with your questions. Um, could you go to the next slide, Megan, please? And then we do have, of course, um, you know, activities, ways to stay connected with WCET and SAN. Um, we have the, um, we have our new SAN website, which has a lot of good information. And I mentioned it before that that will be um, the location where you can find the archive for our webcasts, um, along with the documents that uh, we'll share with the uh, recording of the webcast. And, and also you may want to review the WCET website itself um, for information about activities and issues that are being covered by WCET as well. Um, Megan, why don't I turn this over to you to talk more about uh, what we have left with WCET. Terrific. Thanks so much, Cheryl, and thank you to our presenters, and thanks for Mary Ann for being on and asking some great questions. I hope you found it very valuable, as did I. If you are interested in state authorization and all things higher ed, be sure to join us in Portland October 23rd to the 25th. SAN is on October 22nd. There will be an all-day workshop, and I'm sure you've received information about that. Registration is filling up, so be sure to register today. And again, access previous webcasts on the SAN website, and you can always access WCET webcast recordings on the WCET website. We want to thank our supporting members, as well as our sponsors that underwrite much of our events and programs here at WCET. Without them, we couldn't do much of what we do, so we do appreciate them. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and give you back a little over 10 minutes of your day. So thank you again. Thanks for being part of this, this series, and thanks to Cheryl for putting on this series, and we'll see you in the fall. Bye, all.